All right. So, all right, I'm going to talk today about the path to climate victory. Because, you know, we live in a world right now where people hear about climate every day. There's this growing movement called climate doomers. People who accept that <clears throat> the best we're going to do is lose pretty badly. You know, we're, we talk about goals like 1.5 degrees C and 2 degrees C. Well, 2 degrees C kills every coral reef on Earth. And that's just not that fun to think about, to be honest. So, yeah, I'm going to talk today about how do we flip that narrative and how do we find a path to where we have a world that we want to live in. So, who am I? I'm the CEO and founder of Running Tide. Running Tide is a ocean-based carbon removal company really focused on measuring and understanding ocean health and what things we can do to intervene in the ocean to protect the ocean against the worst ravages of uh, you know, the poly crisis, so biodiversity and carbon removal. I'm um, also a founding signatory of something called the Reykjavik Protocol, which I'll explain what that is today. But um, that's a foundational protocol to help the world generate, um, generate uh, credits for positive action in nature. So if anybody hasn't seen this, these are the planetary boundaries outlined by the Stockholm Institute. And what you're looking at right now is um, us losing badly. So you can see as we're progressing through time, we're exceeding planetary boundaries, not just carbon, but you know, ocean acidification, biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen, um, biodiversity loss, etc. It's just the one metric that we can use to describe like, how badly we're losing this fight. And um, there's a human cost to losing. Um, I'm from a, a, community, a waterfront community, heavily involved in commercial fishing. Um, spending my life outdoors in Maine, and... What? You're from Maine? All right. <laughs> okay. So, you know, really engaged in nature my whole life, and, you know, it's apparent that we're losing, and it's causing... I think it's a big cause of anxiety and depression among a lot of people, the fact that we're watching our environment degrade around us, and I don't think it's... Um, you know, I, I think it's something that isn't talked enough about, and, and I also think that, like, that anxiety needs somewhere to go. And, so, you know, what I'm supposed to say here is we need to stop emitting carbon and decarbonization before we do anything like carbon removal. That's like the party line. We're all supposed to say that. Um, you know, I'm supposed to say carbon removal is for the last 10% of emissions. Um, you know, it's something that we do after we fully decarbonize the economy. I'm supposed to, oops, I'm supposed to say net zero by 2050 is our goal. Um, that's too late. 2050 is 26 years away. Do we want to watch it just get hotter and hotter and hotter and for the next 26 years? Like, I don't. I've seen enough. So I think we're getting it wrong. I think we're getting the story wrong, and I think we're engaging people wrong on this. Um, and getting it wrong is killing the ocean. It's killing rivers. Getting it wrong is leading us to ruin. We're watching the... Amazon rainforests dry out. We're watching coral reefs die. And if we want to win, we need to get this right, the framing correctly. And, you know, while I think that we should all try to be less bad and have less damage on the environment and everything we do, there's a little bit of a constraint on the human spirit there. Um, I love, I'm looking at the recycling and how it's, instead of saying, like, you know, sort your recycling, it's calling it raw materials. Uh, here at Slush. I think that's brilliant. Because that's not about being less bad, that's about being more good. It's like feeding into growth. So, you know, you look around here and you see all this entre entrepreneurial spirit. It's like, how do we unleash this creative spirit to do more good in the world? Uh, how do we unleash this exponential mindset all these people at Slush have on positive action in the world? And that's what I think what we need to do is start thinking about the victory condition. Defining a victory condition. What's the vision for a future? Not plus two degrees C. That's not awesome. That's terrible. What? How about we define the victory condition as pulling everything back in, inside the planetary boundaries? How about we imagine a world for our kids where biodiversity is increasing above this baseline that we have today? Not like, hey, let's see how, let's try to imagine a world where it's like, pretty terrible, but like, we can all still survive. How about like, let's imagine a world where it's like, bountiful. Um, 
That's how we inspire people. That's how you get this creative energy that you feel here, is, from a, is imagining abundance in front of you. So how do we get to victory? We have to incentivize the world we want to live in. So we have to pay people for positive action. If you, if you want to incentivize a world you want to live in, like, I like bees. Like, who doesn't like bees? Bees are really cool. They make honey. They're wonderful. Like, we have to incentivize that. We have to get people out there protecting bees, spreading beehives around. Um, we want to, if you like wildlife, you need wildlife corridors. You need to incentivize people to do that. So we need payment for positive action. Um, and that's how we get to victory. So there's some bad things that we know we're doing, and they create liabilities. So we talk a lot about carbon emissions and taxing carbon, et cetera. There's other bad things. Biodiversity degradation, methane release, albedo reduction, my nightmare, ocean acidification, which kills all the fish. Um, you know, reducing wildlife, water quality, et cetera. And then, you know, sprawl. And then, okay, so we all know about that. And we're like, let's not do that. We can tax that. We can make, make people buy offsets, et cetera. But then let's talk about the good work. Removing carbon, massive amounts of carbon, gigatons, hundreds of gigatons. You know, there's biodiversity enhancement, albedo enhancement, reducing ocean acidification, rewilding. How do we pay people for that? And this is something that's been, there's a, you know, a lot of people in the world that are working on this really hard, and they're imagining all these different cool projects they can do, and they're working on them. But one of the problems is, you know, there's not a ton of trust in people building these, these as assets or credits. So um, a few months ago, we pulled together some of the leading companies in the space, some of the leading scientists um, in the space, and got together and said, okay, like, Let's, set, let's, let's form up a protocol. Let's figure out what are the things we have to do to generate good credits in the world, applicable to all of these different things, and let's just all see what we can agree to. Let's just decide, like, one, get everyone in a room, forget what we disagree on, what do we all agree on makes sense. Um, it was just a really cool experience. And what we pulled together was called, we called it the Reykjavik Protocol, and it's an environmental credit generating protocol. And what it does is give a set of best practices for companies like Running Tide that are doing carbon removal out in the world or doing ocean acidification or biodiversity enhancement. What are the practices you need to do? And I encourage everyone, you know, we have a website. It's a really cool thing. I think that this is something that could help people do more positive action and get paid for it in the world. And there's, you know, 13 principles that make it up. So everyone could agree to it, from scientists to operators and um, entrepreneurs. And it was just like, what are the set of principles, the set of steps you have to do when you go out to do good action in the world such that you can generate a credit and then sell that to somebody and get paid for doing that good work? Um, we formed it, you know, a lot of it's just formed around carbon removal because carbon removal is the project, you know, a you know, $250 trillion problem that we have to take on over the next generation. But, you know, it's applicable to all this good work that we could do in the world. And, you know, it's built on best available science. It outlines which counterparties, who checks your work through the process. Um, it's just a really powerful tool. People talk about um, proof of work in crypto and things like that. Uh, you know, what's the proof of work? What's, well, this is the proof of work for doing good work in the world. And, you know, we formed this up, 12 people in a room, just could we agree to it? And then we just set it loose in the world at New York Climate Week. And by the end of the week, we had 50-plus signatories, all the best companies in the space, or not all of them, but most of the best companies in the space, I think. And it just kind of took off, and it's starting to get adopted, and people are starting to look at their, their work in a really structured way on how do you go do good work in the world, make sure you're respecting communities, make sure you're respecting regulations, make sure that you're building on the best available science you can, and working your way, and making sure there's people there to check your work such that you can generate these credits, sell them in the market, and then go do more work. Um, what this is, is this is the dawn of the largest mobilization and value creation event in human history. $250 trillion in a generation. And it's the stuff, it's, it's, and it, what, it, what is really exciting about all this is it's giving us a vision of the future that's bountiful. And it's a way, like, think about all this creative, creative energy just applied, you know, all this anxiety that we have, all these people out in the world who are running out of economic opportunities. How do we unleash them in the environment around them to do good things and get paid for it? 
Um, you know, that's a really exciting victory condition for me. And I think that, you know, so now you're like, okay, well, this all sounds good. You showed us a diagram with a bunch of boxes and arrows, like, very cool. But what does it look like in practice? So I'll walk you through what we did this year at Running Tide. We created, uh, we called it substrate, but it's basically Tums for the ocean, or an antacid for the ocean, that we, we got some wildfire clear-out material from Canada, brought it up to Iceland, we coated it in 4,000 tons of alkaline materials, and built up a bunch of amazing sensors with some of the best engineers in the world to set them loose and to measure all of this, and we put them out in the ocean, and, you know, quite, you know, 22,000 tons of it, and then measured what happened, and we worked with you know, dozens of uh, researchers. We worked with uh, auditors. We kind of went through this whole Reykjavik protocol to see what we could come up with. It was a giant experiment. Um, and, you know, working with some brilliant people up in Iceland. And what we came out to is 16,000 tons of carbon removal and ocean acidification abatement. And this is what it looked like through the year. We had this amazing uh, cloud uh, amazing data gathering system where we could put out these sensors and watch exactly what would happen. We had machine vision cameras measuring how quickly the materials were dissolving, and, you know, what was sinking, where was it sinking, where was it positioned in the world. And you can imagine this scaling up. So imagine this times hundreds, thousands, boats. Like, think of like uh, Dunkirk when they went and rescued, when the British went to rescue their, uh, their soldiers in World War II. They just took every boat they could and just sent it out into the world. And imagine we did that for ocean acidification. We just went out there and we just put tons of materials out in the world. And everyone, every coastal community in the world was involved in this effort and we could abate ocean acidification. We could halt it in its tracks. And that's what's possible here. Um, so this, you know, we generated, you know, single digit millions of revenue off this. It was, um, didn't quite pay for itself, but close. And, but how do we get to $250 trillion of this? You know, eight, nine orders of magnitude more work. Um, we need wider adoption and participation in the Reykjavik protocol. Running Tide is kind of the first to get it going, but there's like a bunch of other companies now coming behind us. There's a bunch of entrepreneurial sport, spirit getting unleashed on this project. Um, you know, that's, that's the first thing, and we need more than just a few, car you know, 50 carbon removal companies involved in this. We need biodiversity enhancement. We need auditors. We need, you know, buyers in the space. Uh, we need corporations that are trying to offset their, uh, offset their, the negative effects they're having in the world buy into this. And we need more people participating in it. We need, you know, it can't just be, you know, super tech, venture-backed companies that are involved in this. It needs, you know, super tech-enhanced venture-backed companies. It needs to be, you know, people who have a truck, people who live out in, on a farm, um, people who see degraded land in like an old industrial site that are able to engage with this. And we need to trust in Gall's Law. Uh, Gall's Law is a software, um, well, I think it comes from software, but basically it's an idea that any complex system that works, we're going to engage in the world with all this biodiversity and complexity, uh, you know, all complex systems that work are built from simple systems that work. What Running Tide did this year was like big, hard, complex effort, but it was a simple system. You know, we're just, just mixing alkaline materials and floating them on the surface of the water. How do we get that to the level of complexity of the ocean? How do we get that to the level of complexity of the rainforest, into coral reefs, etc.? Well, we start with simple systems that work, and then we evolve and we learn and we continue on. And the, and then we also have to trust in the capacity of innovators to learn exponentially. We have all these amazing tools now. We can measure and watch in real time what's happening out in the middle of the ocean now. Fifteen years ago, you couldn't do that. You know, now with like the level of compute that we can put on a tiny little buoy out in the middle of the ocean, with um, all these machine learning systems that we can apply to this, we can learn exponentially. So we need to trust in that and just get people going. The first projects are going to be simple. The next projects will be a little more complex and sophisticated and honor more of nature. But over, we have to be able to trust people in the process and let these things go. Um, you know, so my kind of last message to everybody here is that there is a structure 
We called it the Reykjavik protocol. Maybe, this, maybe the Reykjavik protocol grows. You know, it's an open source protocol. We'll see where it ends up. But if we can get the structure right around these, in, these markets and these industries, and then we go out and we engage with nature, and we act and do things, and just be bold and go do positive action out in the world, and we learn from that, we have a chance to win. And we have a chance to leave our kids a better world than we have right now, not a significantly worse world, but like somewhat still survivable, like not inspiring. So I, uh, my final message is like for anyone here, please like engage with us on the Reykjavik protocol. We have a, we'll leave the website up here at the end. And I hope that we see more participation. Uh, like I said, it's an open source protocol. We're open to people engaging. Um, you know, we're at the slush audience where there's all these brilliant people working on open source software projects. We'd love people to build on top of what we're working on. So join us. Um, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, we'll see you in a better world, I hope. <laughs> all right. Okay.